What's up, guys? Welcome to Cry About It, the podcast about all those sad songs that make us oh so happy. This week, we are joined by Mike Henberger, and we're going to be talking about his book, Rock Bottom at the Renaissance, an emo kid's journey through, the, through falling in and out of love in and with New York City. I probably messed that up, Mike, didn't I? Uh, it's all right, man. It's a long one. I, yeah. I mean, I think most people have trouble getting through it. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Uh, Thanks, you sent man. it to me um, early on in quarantine, and uh, it, it really was a reprieve for me. I, I took a couple days, kind of decompressed from everything, and, and dedicated it to reading it. Uh, cool. I read it, I've read it twice. Oh, and, wow. And I, I absolutely love it, because I was preparing for this um, pretty far out, but I really did did enjoy it and there's not many books that sort of like more by I guess like books about bands like yeah like this and I think that anybody that's an emo kid or a scene kid especially like a lot of our audience uh kind of developed through our emo night that listened to this and it's yeah. grown, grown since the podcast launched but I think they would really really like this and relate to it I'll cool. give my take on it but can you tell me a little bit like give me your spiel about the book real quick yeah, man. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, dude. I, I mean, I, I love the conversations you have on here and the video, the video content that you've been putting out for, you know, for as I mean, I've in the last year that I like discovered you, um, but all the stuff you put up, like music industry stuff, but just, I don't know, man, I love watching your stuff. So thanks for having me on and thanks for checking out the book. Um, and yeah, man, I, um, and thanks for saying that too, because, because I've, I've heard that a lot and I, I'm glad that that, that, that people are seeing that it's, it's, it is like a easy read. And like, I, like people always, you know, I'll give it to people and some, like I've a couple of people have said, like, I'm not really a reader and I'm not really a reader either. And so this is written by somebody who's not really a reader. So it probably works out well for people who aren't really readers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I started this book uh, almost a decade ago when I was, in like the lowest low of my depression. And I mean, I have major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder. So it's, it's a book about struggling with that. But um, the foundation of the book is the music that kept me alive through all that. So that's a thread throughout the whole book for those who don't know about it or haven't seen it or read it. Um, there's a, a song that goes with every chapter and it's like a soundtrack. So the song pops up throughout the chapter. Um, and that's just kind of how my life has always been, you know, like I wouldn't be here today if not for that music that you're talking about, you know, all pop punk and emo mostly. Um, but I mean, I, I grew up listening to music and having music mean a lot to me. So, um, that's just how this book formed in itself. Like I didn't set out to write it that way. Um, but I've been a music journalist for 15 years. Um, and so I'm, I've written a lot about music. And so while this book is like not about music, it became about music. You know, it's about relationships. It's about thinking you're in love and it's about struggling with mental illness and having that make things seem horrible um, when they might not be. Um, that's what it's about. But because everything in my life has been about music, it also became about music. So I think that that's one of the things about the book, um, like Mike touched on, that I found very interesting. So we're we're around the same age, and um, that's the music that that formed my youth and and young adulthood and everything as well. And you're following this progression through the book, and like he said, every chapter there's a song, and they're they're just very telling songs and and very strong lyrical songs and and emotional yeah. songs, and following them through. Like once you once you get into about the third chapter, you start to really see how they weave their way in. Like there's different parts of the song break up um, the chapter that you're reading. I thought that was a really cool concept that I that I never really saw before. But I feel like a lot of people, especially like in that that emo pop punk um, early two thousands type of scene or or whatever, people that are fans of that music, I think in lyrics a lot. I find right yeah. Like, like I can relate a song to a moment in time or something happens and like, it'll, it'll bring this song flooding to me. And, and I think a lot of my emotional state is tied to those songs and I've never had somebody really connect the dots like that for me. So I really appreciated that. 
Yeah, man. Thanks. Um, and that's exactly what it is for me too. And I, I've mentioned it in the book that like, I, I, I have a musical mind. And so, um, and in the first chapter, I <clears throat> point out that like, you know, songs don't always relate to what's going in my life, going on in my life, but I find a way to make them relate. Um, because yeah, that's just how, um, and I think it might be a big thing for like people in, in our generation and maybe, you know, young, like, like two generations younger than us, but, uh, but um, we, we've related to music differently, I think. Um, and that's how, you know, a lot of us learned to, you know, love and a lot of us learned a lot of things about life. And so I think naturally when we need to figure something out in our head, like a song pops up or something like that. And that's, I mean, that's what it was for me. And um, like for the longest time, and still I'd love, like I, I, one of my dream jobs is to be like a, a music supervisor and like pick songs that go on TV shows and movies. <clears throat> and I almost went that direction in my life, but ended up going in the direction that brought me to New York and work at Comedy Central a long time ago. Um, but that's exactly what this book is, is I basically just music supervised it, you know? Um, it just naturally happened. And I think people who do that for a living are kind of are those people who like tell that story the way I told this story story you know they like their part played in a tv show or movie is to like enhance the story with music and that's basically kind of just what happened with this book so the writing process you you detail your writing process for the book um yeah in the book right so I don't want to give any of that away but outside of it did you kind of did you come up with the the playlist first or no. did you, or did the playlist develop as you wrote the book? Yeah. It developed as I, as I wrote the book and like, you know, like in the first chapter, the first, the song that goes with the first chapter is 23 by Jimmy Eat World. And I write about how, what happens in the first chapter, 23 came on my headphones while that was happening. And so, you know, while I was writing about it, it just popped into my head that that song was playing. Um, but then, you know, some stuff that we can give away is that I, I like the book, you know, takes place in present day, but then also has like every, almost every other chapter is a flashback. Um, and in present day, I'm in a hotel room for the weekend, um, just writing and popping Adderall and drinking scotch and writing um, and dealing with this like heartbreak that I was dealing with at the time. Um, and there's like three Bayside songs in the book and three dangerous summer songs in the book and those are just the bands that I especially back then would go to I mean you can look behind me there's a dangerous summer poster and a Bayside poster and a Jimmy Eat World poster in the book at, that I you know like I said I started this 10 years ago probably finished it like five or six years ago um and even back then like Jimmy Eat World, Bayside and Dangerous Summer were huge bands for me because they're just who I turned to when I was feeling down and so like in that hotel room, Bayside songs were playing and Dangerous Summer songs were playing. And they're just the bands that I knew the best at that time. And probably still, well, definitely still, um, they're still like my top bands. Um, and so that's how those songs just came in. Like, you know, when you read the book, you see how relevant the lyrics of Poison in My Veins are to that chapter or Tortures of the Damned are to that chapter. Um, and so, it takes ab it took absolutely nothing for me to like I didn't have to sit there and be like what song goes with this chapter because those songs were so ingrained in me you know um I've been a Bayside fan since before they released the full length record um so yeah those songs are just in my head um and then there's other chapters where like um there's like the Alkaline Trio chapter sorry about that which did kind of come like popped into my head later after I'd written that chapter or the wonder years. Um, I just want to sell out my funeral. Like that song didn't even exist when I started the book, you know, right. um, but it just fit perfectly with the chapter that it goes with. So it's different for some of them. Um, you know, some of them were just like playing in the background happen. And some of them I just knew in my head or like just naturally came to my head when I was writing that chapter, but right. absolutely none of them took, any time for me to be like oh man I really need a I really need a song to go with this like none of it was forced <clears throat> so I I first of all two things um kind of wrapped into one I love the actual use of 
of emo kid right especially like in the subtitles so yeah um, <clears throat> i think that's so telling because anybody who came from that like emo kid was that was just a term like that's that's kind of an insider yeah. insider term right like my mom doesn't know what emo kid is or something like that maybe now but like as you were writing that book it was still kind of like a cliche type of thing or not cl- non yeah. cl- non cliche type thing right um there weren't yeah. huge emo nights and everything yet yeah. um but the song selection i think adds such authenticity to the book right like you speak uh you, you mentioned alkaline trio and jimmy Eat world and and those are big household name bands but the inclusion of somebody like the wonder years and like you said multiple dangerous summer songs like that speaks to somebody who's ingrained in the culture so yeah. i was able to relate to it um from my perspective like those are bands that like if i talk to like my my normie buddy you know like yeah, he, yeah. he doesn't know who the dangerous summer is but like i'm like man like this is the band that never made it that was so great that you know self destruct you know like i can spew off everything about that band um so i think that adds such an authenticity to it yeah for sure thanks i i like no one's ever pointed that out and i i didn't really think about that either but um yeah now i'm glad that there's that like i passed the test you know like if somebody reads it like yeah there's there's actually like um you know even like like i said for those who haven't read it there's a a song that goes with every chapter but within the chapters there's also mentions of other songs in there and in that alkaline trio chapter there's a mention of how i how you know the girl that that chapter is about we worked together and we would like instant message each other stuff and one of the things that like we would send each other music and one of the songs i sent her was so contagious by acceptance you know and that's kind of like one of those that like kind of under the radar for main sh- for a lot of mainstream only people um but then i also mentioned the juliana theory i was wearing a juliana theory shirt when she and i went out um and so that's another one too and i and i i i mean the thing is is like those stories are a hundred percent true and i'm i'm glad that those are in there because i have had people like um i've had people tell me they never heard of not that this is an emo band, but two door cinema club, great, like indie dancey pop rock band. Um, somebody told me they discovered them through this book. Somebody told me that like, they didn't know about these dangerous summer songs that are in there or certain Bayside songs that are in there even, you know, because like I said, I, I, when I played in a band back in like 2002 or 2003, um, my brother and I booked Bayside, um, at our college and like nobody came it was just like them in my band and so i've just loved bayside since then you know um <clears throat> and then like yeah a lot of those bands i've just like known for so long cuz i'm i'm 38 years old you know and um and uh but yeah so i i love that people are discovering you know certain bands from here too or they're being reminded about them cuz like you said the dangerous summer you know, they might have like self-destructed a while back, but they're back in full force now, you know, exactly. and they're doing amazing. So, um, you know, if there are people who are just discovering them now from their new stuff, they might be able to like see some of their old stuff in here. Yeah. yeah similar to you booking Bayside and nobody coming. I booked a dangerous summer when I had my club five times, <laughs> they only showed up one out of the five times I booked them. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But great guys and I always enjoy yeah no self I, yeah right? I, yeah but, um I remember I, I like I said I, I love those guys and I, I mean I know AJ now and and he's also you know changed a lot too and mm-hmm. I, I I love that I met him now and have kind of become friends with him now because he's so positive and he's so like determined you know and that that band's gonna do a lot of great things I mean they already are but uh but yeah back in the day before they broke up I mean, a couple times that I saw them, like he would sometimes be too drunk to remember the lyrics and that bummed me out because those songs meant so much to me, you know? Right. And I also, I enjoy uh, every podcast episode that we've done so far. And it's weird that it's that band. There's a Juliana theory (laughs) has come up in every podcast I've done. That's so Um, funny. Yeah. I heard, I listened to your, uh, to your podcast with Neil Rubenstein and he, I heard he brought them up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those guys too, man, they're like, they disappeared for a while and they're, and that's a band that like, you know, the, so many bands we listened to would not be around if not for the Juliana theory. And a 100%. lot of people have never heard of them, you know, 
and that record emotion is dead means so much to so many people um <clears throat> but uh for me it was just that i was a tooth and nail records kid and so like right. anything tooth and nail records put out back then um i w- i was into um but yeah i've gotten to like meet brett and josh since then too and they're both great guys and um yeah man that's another great band that you know i hope i hope some people check out yeah i'm i'm really i'm probably cued into a little bit um my buddy mark woodbridge is their manager um, oh yeah i know mark yeah I, yes. I know i know mark fairly well i would run into him at every show and um Good. he helped me out with um i got a i have a charity called zero platoon where i interview bands and um work with bands to reach out to people in the military who deal with mental health issues and um he's hooked me up with some of his bands and um yeah now I, I i text him every now and then too and we keep saying we're going to get a drink but the world never opens back up so yeah, exactly. yeah he's a great guy great one of the best guys um yeah. My my introduction to kind of the music industry, um, I was managing a band at a time called I Am Legend out of uh, okay yeah Connecticut, yeah. and they went on their first like U.S. tour or whatever, um, supporting Driver Side Impact when Mark was in Driver Side Impact. So oh, we cool. spent a couple of weeks on the road together, and uh, that was the first one out on, like first time out on the road like that. Um, those guys kind of showing us how to cut our teeth, and uh, Mark and I just clicked from day one and uh have been longtime friends since and i'm just so happy yeah. f- for everything awesome that's that's going on for him so yeah i think he was working with the dangerous summer too for a little bit yep. when they first started coming back yeah mm-hmm. yeah he's uh he's got his pulse on on yeah. everything it's it's it great really does yeah even just recently too like last week which i mean it's a podcast who knows when people listen to this but like i just i just remember like actually a couple of days ago or last week he had like three artists like getting big coverage and yeah man he's doing great yeah very happy uh for it seems like the that the early 2000s scenes kind of coming into their own business wise and everything like that and all these people are re-emerging and i and i and i love to see it um yeah a second look right yeah i mean i i hope it i hope it shows people or like because i've always thought that it had staying power you know and i i i worked at billboard magazine for a little while and i i worked at rolling stone for a little bit and um billboard i was like a staff video producer there and i was always trying to bring these acts in because i like in it's just go it's like juliana theory like their fans from 10 years ago are still there they never went anywhere and they still care about them as much as we did 10 years ago you know um and i i feel like that's the difference between this kind of music and like a pop act on the radio you know like I feel like people don't connect, like you can enjoy pop music and dance to it and everything, but you're not connecting it to it the same way. People like Justin Bieber can have the millions of fans that he has, but they're not connecting to it. Like people tend to grow out of that stuff. And, and that happens for some, you know, pop punk and stuff too. But I think, I think it's, it's definitely, there's definitely a lot more of pop punk and emo that people just connect to. And that's why like this book that, you know, exists is because these songs that are, 10 years old or older i'm still connected to them you know 100 percent. i i have found that um obviously through different business ventures like i this podcast is kind of born of an emo night right um yeah i do these emo nights and and we did one kind of as a joke uh like five or six years ago now and we sold out a bar like on like a couple facebook posts and i realized i was like wow like i knew i was still disconnected to this music but everybody is um and that was kind of before the whole like brooklyn and la blow up so like we were kind of like i was like people are doing this in these big cities like i wonder if it would work in scranton like i'm gonna try yeah dude and it and to my surprise it did no i know that's a that's something i've i've said too like (laughs) i've joked about it with my wife about like moving to somewhere like columbus or somewhere and like i could just do an emo night like i know it'll work <laughs> like 100 percent. so we we've uh circumvented like b markets like or, as or, nice. or made it so it's like we do scranton lancaster harrisburg state college every two months and we just throw these bangers and and just like that's Very our cool. circuit and and it's turned yeah. into something but i remember being like like, you know, high school, college, and, you know, being obsessed with uh, Dashboard Confessional and Motion City Soundtrack and my yeah. t- and Taking Back Sunday and, like, my friends, like, being, like, more of, like, the OAR and or just, like, <laughs> listening to Tom Petty and, you know, yeah. getting getting super into Bruce Springsteen and everything. And, and those would be the people that always be like, yeah, like, it, it's good. Like, they would always show a little bit of respect to it because I was, like, 
I was like the music guy, like, you know, like, the, Oh, that's Joe likes the weird music that nobody knows. Um, so they would like understand it and be like, yeah, you probably like good stuff. But they would always say the whole, yeah, but like Bruce Springsteen, like is still here from when our, <laughs> when our, when our parents yeah. were kids, right. What, what, are you going to listen to those bands when you're 30? Yeah. Like I'll go yeah. see Taking Back Sunday tomorrow. I, you know, like I'm still yeah, going man. to see them. I'm not going to, you know, be in a mosh pit right now. But I'm well, gonna stand around drinking IPA and watch them, you know. Dude, they're they're one of the few bands that like, cause I just, I mean, the last time I saw them, cause there were no concerts last year, um, but uh, I saw them at Riot Fest 2019. Okay. Uh, wait, is that right? Um, yeah, I think 2019. Um, and uh, they did an after show with the Get Up Kids, and I went to that, and I I work my way through the crowd all the way up to the bar- to the barricade for like all of taking back Sunday set. And I was like 37 right. years, 36, 37 years old, but they're one of those bands. Them and like, <laughs> I say MXPX, but like, cause the last few times I saw MXPX, I got in the mosh pit in my 30, mid thirties. And the last time I did it, I fell down. Like I got in and like within five seconds, I was on the ground, got up, kept moshing five seconds on the ground, got up, five seconds on the ground and then got out right. so i may never mosh to mxpx again but like there are some bands that like i can't stand in the back for. very few but right. there I, are still some i i say that too but then um so <laughs> I, i'm i'm from scranton and uh well right outside scranton but i grew up with the men singers like those guys and yeah. i were like in high school at the same time and you know watch them evolve throughout the years and they do a big holiday show every year and that's like you're there it's it's the reunion of everybody from everywhere comes home for christmas you go and uh i decided my little brother like made an offhanded comment a couple it, i think it was like 2019 or 2018 he was just like i don't like music with with guitars in it and I, was, <laughs> I was just like what you know i was like you're coming to the show with us tonight right you're gonna go learn what guitar music is so this was 2017 it was the last year of warp tour so uh i took him and he was just like oh i what is this? Like, this isn't on the radio. Like, I like this. And I was like, yeah, man, like, you don't have to find everything on the radio. But that night, like, certain songs came on. And I was just like, all right, I'm going to take him into the mosh pit. And I'm going to go. And my wife would look at me and she'd be like, just go. Just like, go do it. But then the next (laughs) morning, I was like, oh, man, I can't move. So I I don't know that that we ever totally lose it. Um, But I I, I can't stay out of the pit for them. And I I assume been a while since i saw take it back sunday live uh but it would probably be tough for certain songs to stay out for them too. yeah yeah man they're still so great live so one of the things that that i so i love i love pop culture on top of like loving music and everything right like i'm uh i'm like a a big the challenge on mtv nerd like oh <laughs> un, un, until ct's not on it anymore then i then i'm gonna I, yeah. I promise i retire but until if I was with you. I was with you till you got to that stuff because I, well, I can't watch that stuff. But I'm a huge pop culture nerd too. Oh, only that. Just and only if I won't watch the seasons that CT is not on. I just love okay. that, that guy for some reason is burned into me. <laughs> but I I I feel like this section of pop culture or 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 subculture or whatever has been kind of left out of the mainstream. Like as far as like a nostalgic yeah. look back, right? Like. Like I love this book because it's a reflection on that point in time and it's it's being reflected. Whereas like I feel like it, it it's neglected to some point. We have I, I look back and I'm like, you know, you have these moments in time in books or movies that are highlighted, be it almost famous or the various books about the eighties punk, uh SLC yeah. punk. I, I feel like there has it like it had its moment, like when it was relevant, like One Tree Hill, like featured Jack's Mannequin yeah, and all that and like stuff. Yeah, like the OC and right, but there hasn't uh, been like yeah. this nostalgic <laughs> look back on it, and and this this did it for me. Like I I loved that. Cool. Um, yeah, man. I I um, I'm glad you said that too. Except that I I don't want to tip anyone off to beating me to making a TV show about right. it <laughs> about that time. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, because uh yeah i really want to turn this into a tv show which like still you know wouldn't really do that for that time period except i would make sure that it like you know in the flashbacks and it it included the music and stuff but i don't think it would you know the book doesn't really cover like the whole culture side of it um but yeah i mean 
Yeah, it's it's weird that it was like so it's so prevalent in pop culture in like the early 2000s with like the OC and One Tree Hill and all those shows. Um, and then like people just turn their back on it. But I think it's the same thing as everything, man. It's like, you know, people in charge of pop culture are always out of touch. <laughs> and right. and and so I mean, like like that's what was hot at the time that's why it was on the oc and that's why it was on one tree hill um and so the second it didn't look hot to them anymore it was just abandoned um but it stayed you know like we're just talking about it's it's still kept the same audience that it had then um but yeah i mean i i hope that i can do something with it um i even told when i i drove out to nashville last year um in like september and uh got a bunch of copies of the book autographed so i can raffle them off for charity when the audiobook drops and so chris carava signed a bunch of books and posters um uh anthony and jack from bayside signed a bunch um matt hoops from reliant k signed a, like they all signed the same copies of the book um and i told anthony that because like i wanted him to know that like how important this was to not only me but to the to the people that it's important to it's i mean we're not just like you know casual fans like you of all people know having an emo night you know people are crazy about this shit um 100 percent. and yeah the pat i've never like there's no there's no 80s hair metal night there's no you know what i mean like that's just that <laughs> yeah. hasn't been a thing um, yeah you know, uh, I, I've heard talks of somebody in our hometown that wants to start a new a new metal night, so that could be kind of interesting. But I feel like that would just end yeah. bloody. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, I do I, love a good I do love a good like indie dance party night, like completely like some um, block party and block of party, Montreal hockey, and stuff. The hives and mm-hmm. um, yeah, man, all that stuff. Like I love yeah. yeah, like a good indie dance music night. I agree with that. Uh, Philly has a, or well, when I was young and, and still going out, Philly used to have some really, really cool nights like that where I'd be able I to I went to a goth myself. night in Philly, which is one of the yeah. best memories I have. I, I wish I could remember the bar, but I was on tour with Have Mercy and Gates and Penimento. Okay. Um, and this is like 2015, I think. And they played a venue that had an upstairs and a downstairs. And the downstairs had a goth night right after their show. Um, and I don't know, it was one of the more, what, what are like the cool like venues back in 2015 in Philly, do you know? So I'm, I'm thinking of the one that the, the up and up, was, up and downstairs like a, one was like. The Barbary, is that the thing? So the Barbary is one. Uh, I think Barbary. it was the Barbary. So the Barbary, uh, um, I'm trying to remember if, if there's like an upstairs place to play, but there was a really cool, cool like one that the guys from, um, the starting line were involved in uh, oh, okay. managing and stuff that was like in Northern Liberties, but, but I the think, Barbary, I think Barbary, it was the Barbary. Though, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just a crazy goth night and everybody got a little wasted and yeah. Good times. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so I, again, I, I love the, the documenting of, of, of a time and place. And I think you hit your, I know you, you say you're not a writer or, or storyteller. Um, a little bit but your description of of 9-11 like that moment and I don't want to give anything away from the story but just just that description like that could I could see that as a tv scene like like that created a picture in my mind and a you know being from like of that time um it brought back emotions and and everything kind of came flying back and that's like one of my favorite moments of the book yeah um, or or i don't know favorite but like striking moments um so this i think translates to a mini series a, a tv show undoubtedly yeah, i i appreciate that cuz i when i like i mean there's like i said i i i i wrote i started writing this like 10 years ago um but i was also at this which is very clear in the book at this point in my life where my head was just so messed up you know, from depression and anxiety. I was two years out of the army, which is when I got diagnosed with that stuff. Um, I was not working on my mental health at all. Whereas now I made so much progress because I do the hard work of 
you know, talking to a therapist, taking the medication, meditating, trying to exercise, trying to sleep better. Um, and some of that's brand new, man. Like some of that's this, you know, last six months, I've just been trying to get my shit together with sleep. Um, and so like, it's hard work. And so there's some, there's a lot of stuff in that book that I write, that I wrote, that I am not like proud of, but I, you know, wasn't going to change it because I wanted people to see that how, how weird my head was at that time. And, and when I talk about, you know, and so what I'm getting at is like when I, cause I've been listening to the audiobook a lot cause I'm working on getting it out and making promo stuff for it. So, um, when I, when I have heard that part, um, cause, and I mean, it doesn't spoil anything, but just so people aren't like wondering what I'm talking about. Right. Um, you know, I talk about how, like I was living in Austin, Texas and I was 18 when that, when 9-11 happened and, and, and I say how, like, I felt like the farther you away, the farther away you were from it, the less real it felt. And, um, you know, but also I say that that could be just because I was 18 and I was a, a selfish teenager who wasn't really thinking about the world and just thinking about myself. And so, um, but there's times when I hear that now and I'm just like, ugh, I know, because like, you know, my wife's from New York and that kind of bothered her reading that. Right. Um, and I can, I can imagine it could bother some people, but it doesn't make it any less true. You know, I, I just wrote how honestly I saw that. Um, and I mean, fortunately I've gotten a lot of feedback about the book from a lot of people and nobody has said that that's ruined it for them or anything. No, so. not at all. I thought it, I thought it was super real. Um, especially like the, everything about it. I, I, I thought it lended to the book and the story because I think, and maybe it's because I'm not from New York either, right? We're close geographically being in Scranton, but, but not in the city. Um, yeah. Like, you know, I had the traditional, like same feelings as you. Like, I think the further removed, the more um, it was a, a life event, but like not directly affecting your life. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, 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 I was trying to think as I, as I was preparing for this today, like what, what have I ever read that like this kind of not compares to, but I found it such an easy read, which I'm not like, I don't sit down and read, right? Like yeah. I'll, I skim. It takes me like a month to read a book, right? Dude, I, not, me too. I have so many books, the, all the books that I've bought in the last year have been books written by like friends or people I know. And I've read, I read like one of them, like last year when I was still commuting to work. So in like January and I haven't read another book since. Right. And I have all these books around that my friends wrote and I need to finish or start some of them. I, I knocked this out in three days wow. and I, I just, there's two other books that ever come to mind and, and they read very similar um, as far as like, it's somebody. And so I, I was trying to think like, what, what kind of books do I like? Like, what, what is this that did it for me? Um, and, and I compare it to um, Lewis Black, the comedian, yeah. um, his two like autobiographies that kind of like tell his story. Um, and, and weirdly enough, he comes from like kind of a, a punk rock background. Like he, uh, oh, cool. he was like, he like cut his teeth. His first gig ever was working at Toads in Connecticut, right? Like opening huh. for, punk, for punk bands. Like he would be the comedian between bands. Wow. And then like, then goes on like these crazy twists and turns through like, like various, um, again, you know, diving into his mental state at the time. Yeah. And, he's and, got and a very his, scattered, scattered brain too. I right. love his comedy. So that's cool. And then I had a, a professor in college, um, who like, he wrote the end. He like, he would, he specialized in rewriting the ends of movies. Cause apparently oh, wow. like the ends <laughs> of movies like suck. So like he rewrote the end of, uh, almost famous and like did really? like a, a bunch of different stuff like that yeah wow i love um, cameron crowe so much that's so weird to hear right and he's uh he's had like 40 book, or he had like at that time 40 books published and he would walk to the front of the room with a garbage bag full of books and dump them out in the beginning of each class and he'd be like these are all the books i've written and you'd like he's like but i'm not gonna tell you what any of the marks they don't matter um what matters is what i'm gonna teach you and he never wrote under his own name. So huh. at one point I got really interesting because he would like drop little like 
like I could tell he was a music guy, but he was like like seventy. You know, he was like older, yeah. long hair, like hippie guy. And uh, I found the one book that he ever wrote under his own name. It's called "Burn Down the Night" by Craig Key Street, and it's about a summer he spent doing drugs with Jim Morrison in LA. <laughs> awesome. And it's this amazing reflection back on him coming in and out of like, and it's kind of when he realized that he had some stuff going on. You know, it was like, it's about battling demons. Yeah. And, and at some point you actually question like, is Jim Morrison really there? Or is it, is he making this up? But then the end, it kind of wraps up with like, this is an, this is a autobiographical retelling of, the moments as I remember them of yeah. the summer I spent. So like he kind of brings it home, but like you're wondering about it through the times and the way he describes a lot of stuff, I, I related back. And those are the only other two books I've ever read, like in a couple sittings. Cool. Um, so it, it, me not being a, a, a big reader, I recommend this to anybody, especially people that listen to this podcast that would, I think, connect to it. It's Thanks, an man. easy read. It's in language that is direct and raw and that you're going to absorb as somebody who loved that music or, or came up with it. And a lot of like, again, why this podcast was started on the year anniversary of people uh, of, of our emo nights stopping. We had a lot of people reaching out to us about mental health uh, or how they would use that mental health and, and um, things like that. And I think there's a lot to be taken away from this book. Yeah. Uh, if you're anybody that's, that's going through the different phases of that. Yeah, for sure. Because if, I mean, the main thing that it's about is my struggle with depression and anxiety, like um, locking myself up in a hotel room, you know, struggling with whether or not, you know, like, why, why can't I be loved, whether or not I deserve to be loved? Um, you know, what mistakes am I making that, um, you know, keeps me from being loved? And why am I alone? And it's, and it's, it's nothing that's so, it, it's nothing unique at all. It's actually a feeling that we all have at least once in our life, but m most of us more, way more than that. And it's just, you know, the only unique thing about it is how I tell my story, but it's something that we've all, we've all felt before. And, and it, it, I truly do believe that it's something that is like an emo night or a show right now when we can't go to those things, you know, um, we get, we get songs popping up through it and, you know, we're, there's people in it that you'd probably see at a show or at an emo night. Um, and, and I mean, the thing is, is that like, I think part of the reason it comes off that way when you read it, it's an easy read is that like, I learned how to write as a songwriter playing in bands, like singing in bands. I learned how to write, you know, three minutes at a time or like five minutes at a time. Um, and then I was a music journalist for a long time. And so there's like, if you're interested in music, then I probably know how to write for you, you know? Right. So I want to go through just some of the, the things that I highlighted here and I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold you to like remembering an exact line in a book or anything, but. Um, Dude, I have read this book so many times in the last two years, just like cutting quotes for promo stuff right. and cutting clips for the audiobook. Like I've, uh, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> awesome. And I, I feel like in emo music, um, fandom, whatever you want to call it, lyrics matter so much more to the fan. Like you connect with those lyrics, yeah. right? Like, like I, yeah. I, I always had that conversation where like a lot of people, like, like I can never listen to fish or like, Oh, me that stuff because I'm just like I need lyrics I need to connect to the lyrics right like yeah um so in this book like you said being a songwriter like a lot of it like hits me like like a, a, a line in a song so like cool. as I go through any book I always highlight stuff uh for my second read through um, I'm gonna take notes too to see what if I missed anything that I should have pulled so this just seemed like so on the nose and and something that I think that like people who especially musicians like this line the one or two songs may be good enough to be the single, but they're not all supposed to be the single or they're not all supposed to be. I think it's so important, especially this day. Well, to me that, that hits cause I love listening to albums, right? Like yeah. I love, I love the work as a whole. I love the broader picture, the full story, the full movie. And yeah. And you can relate this to so many different parts of life that 
Yeah. Not not everything is going to be that hit single, but that doesn't make it any less valuable or or any less worthy, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, totally true. And and that's like in the introduction where mm-hmm. I'm I'm kind of like giving myself an excuse in case the book sucks. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um so uh but but I mean I I I feel pretty good. like I like I also say in the book it wouldn't be out you wouldn't be reading it if I wasn't proud of every part of it you know um but uh but yeah man that's that's definitely true for um and and it's and it's you know something like we don't give people enough credit for it's like it's like if one song sucks um you know like I was I listened to your your thing about the new data remember record you know and it's like some I, I, I can't remember if it was a comment. I mean, there were, like you said, there were so many con- like posts about the data. Remember new record, but on a comment thread, somebody was like, there was like going back and forth about like only these two songs are good. And then someone was like, nah, nah, the album sucks. Only these five songs are good. Like how many fucking songs do you need to be great, man? Like, exactly. hundred percent. I, I I also liked that the whole thing of like, the new thing that I've seen like in the last two days is, is everybody's take that like, they should have just done this album under a different name. Like mm-hmm. who the hell are you going to tell them to, 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 yeah. to make that move? Right. No. And I saw like the Juliana theory just released like some, like a reimagined record of like some of their older songs and somebody just like commented on the Juliana theories posts when they like released one of their single, like the first single off of it, they were like, this isn't very good, but because your old stuff means so much to me, I'm still here for you guys. Like, who are you, man? Like, why do you have to go out of your way to say that? Like, they're not doing it for you. Like, right. Yeah, I, I think as, as I've aged, um, and, and you might recognize this from being a music journalist, like a real music journalist, right? Like, I wrote a lot when I was in college for bunch of different blogs and you know um uh, some absolute oh, same here i mean absolute punk four, stuff and, 14 years of my 15 right. years was that. i mean my brother and i started our own magazine so we could have somewhere to write right. you know and and a lot of what i would get dumped on me is like you know the entry person would be like well review this album or you know do this and i look back now like like i have boxes of old clippings and everything and i'm just like yeah, yeah like who the fuck was i like i was I was this like, <laughs> like 19 to 22 year old kid that didn't know shit about anything. And I'm like, like I'm dumping on somebody else's art, you know, like somebody yeah. else's story. Um, and, and a lot of the time, maybe not even like, like that was, I was an early adopter of social media of all that. So like, like I knew what was going to get me views and clicks, right? Like even uh, back yeah. then. So like, I think some of it was probably like me trying to be edgy or, but even then it was like, like I had a column in the, in the, uh, school newspaper like on the front page of the entertainment section so it was like yeah if in those first three lines above the fold i could shock somebody or like piss them off enough like they're gonna read and they're gonna go through the whole thing and then everybody (laughs) on campus is gonna be like hating me or loving me at that point but now i like i would struggle so hard and i i struggle in my videos because like at the end of the day i'm always gonna come around to any of it being like yeah it's somebody else's art and somebody else did this uh i can never like totally dump on it you know, like, yeah, for sure. And I mean, there's, that's, there's a part of my book too, where I talk about like when I would write about music, I never felt like I was an authority on it. And this might be partially from me coming from just like a small town where there was no exposure to like indie music and like emo and pop punk. So for me, my brother and I would drive two and a half hours to San Antonio or four hours to Austin, watch bands, interview bands, and then bring come back home and write about them to show people about them you know so like there was no room for negative stuff we only we only brought back what we wanted people to know about right and so that's kind of how I started writing and so I think I just carried that along with me like if if something sucked I didn't I didn't I didn't have enough um I don't I don't know what do they say like I didn't have enough inches to to hate you know like I didn't have enough space to to waste my time or my space on something I didn't like, you know? Absolutely. Um, and and then there were times too where I like um like the the music, the like the big rock venue in Corpus Christi asked me to be a judge of their battle of the bands. And so part of the like participating in the battle of the bands is I would write a review of your band in our magazine. Mm-hmm. And um 
and so like but it was just like that man I was this was when I was my early to mid 20s and it was just like that it was like I don't like metal at all but I can respect a good guitar solo and a badass drummer you know right. I can't do any of those things so I'm gonna write about because I like had to write about these bands when I probably wouldn't have written about them otherwise I always I always found good things to write about you know and it's just like you said it's their art they have the balls to get up and do it and the the discipline to learn but also put into it man how are you gonna hate on that right I, there's very few people I, I think like to truly like criticize or whatever like I would want to see somebody who's done like for me to, for me just personally being so ingrained in that world to take something to heart, like somebody that's achieved what a day to remember has achieved in the yeah. same aspect would have to like, for me to take it serious, be like, let me explain to you why this is wrong with this. You know what I mean? But somebody in that position would never do that because they've been through the same thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's like, it's instead like, you know, Johnny likes downfall of us all has a tattoo on his arm and now he's upset <laughs> about it or whatever. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's another long line. And I, I feel like this, uh, this sums up like a generation of, of emo kids, like as a whole, this line. Um, I, I actually highlighted this one in green because I really wanted to remember it <laughs> today. Uh, so, uh, you'll find that I learned early enough in life that I'm not cool. Therefore, trying, trying is a fool's errand. Uh, here, let me prove it. And then you go into talking about the, the discography of, of Jimmy World. Yeah, how I discovered Jimmy World yep. <laughs> from, from Never Been Kissed. Right. right. And, I, and I think that that's... Uh, that's something that, that, especially if you're going back to that, that place of time, like all, all of us, right? Like you, you, you were like, you're probably not the high school football starting quarterback. If you were the, the, the guy at the shows on the weekend playing punk rock music, right? Like, yeah, we, we all came from that. Like, like there, and if you could go back and talk to, to yourself, then it's like, yeah, you were, you're, you're doing pretty cool. Right. Like, like you were, pre yeah. you're doing pretty good, but like that whole, like, um, like I think it's like a quote or a meme or whatever that I always see going on. It's like the I was uncool before it was cool or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I've always I've always liked that, but then this like like that that hit me, and I was just like, man, like like I related so much to that, especially back then. Um, yeah. Like when I think back on myself, like even ten years ago. Yeah. Well, and and I think that it's like. And I don't know, I don't know if this is across the board, but I would, I would say it probably is. Like, I feel like we could all, um, if we actually like sat down and thought about those times where we, you know, saw how uncool we are, like, you're always going to think you're uncool. But, but now, like, when I look back at that, it's the same. I'm like talking about when I was, um, when I discovered Jimmy at World, but then I talk about listening to them at, a hot when I worked at Hot Topic in like a yuppie like white kid mall you know um but to be honest like I look back at that now and every kid who walked into that Hot Topic thought I was cool because right. if you go into a Hot Topic you think everyone who works there is cool because they get to work there you know exactly and yep. so like I might have thought I was uncool but like someone else thought I was cool so there's probably yep. that's probably the truth always you know um, back back home, the same guy has worked behind the counter of the local re <laughs> record shop my entire life, oh, yeah, like yeah. from high school to to now. If I go in there, same guy, and I could like mention the most obscure thing in the world, and he can go over there and just pin through like a bunch of UCDs and find it for me or vinyl or whatever. Yeah, he's the coolest guy in the world to me, and that's cool to me right? too. But I bet there's probably a ton of people who talk shit about that guy who never did anything with his life. Fuck, man, no way. That's awesome to me. And he's probably happier. Like he just sits there oh, all day, sure. burns incense, and listens to <laughs> whatever album he wants. And he's probably so happy. Like he's done it forever, so he's got to yeah. be, you know. And then uh, one of the, one of the other things, I, I I won't go through everything, but. One of the ones that, that also hit me, so I was the kid, like I said, my, my buddies. So when I got into to working in music, um, I, would, I would always, from the people that I kind of joined up with and we formed kind of a, a promotion throughout Eastern Pennsylvania, they would always be like, you're like, like the emo kid, but you're like a bro too. And I, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of quote, uh, equate that. And like, like I always get that with like the hats I wear and stuff. I kind of equate that to like, I grew up like playing sports and like I came from this yeah. small town where like, like, listen, I loved football, but I was like, when I was a senior, we were listening to like 
the Ataris on the ride to the to the to the thing, you know, like so yeah. so so I was in this weird world where I was always kind of pulled between. But every weekend I was at Cafe Metropolis, the like dive venue in Wilkes Ferry, in a mosh pit listening to you know whatever band it was be it my chemical romance Hawthorne heights like all that stuff and and beyond but i was usually alone right so so i i went yeah. to those shows by myself um you know high school girlfriend i would get to come along you know on occasion um if it was like she was like the super indie chick that like was too good for most things but like sometimes i could pull <laughs> her along convince her and then like occasionally like com- like it was somebody big like newfound glory like convince a friend to come along with me right yeah but never felt alone and never felt more of a community than being at those shows uh, with those people yeah. on my own, like walking in, not knowing anybody. And by the end, having all these best friends and, yeah. and, and you, you talk about that. Um, and uh, I think the quote was uh, the people in the crowd singing along every word with me, become my friends. If those songs mean as much to them as they do to me, we're family. Yeah. I, I, I'm gonna put that on my wall. Like that. That's <laughs> that. To me, that that sums up my literal existence for the first 25 years of my life, right? Yeah, and I I remember the show when I that like I was thinking of when I wrote that it was a Get Up Kids show. Um, that yeah, I just had to go to by myself, and I I hated the idea of that every time. But then when I got there, it was exactly what I needed it to be. You know. I think it speaks to the music and and I've always uh so I I I just sing my heart out in the car. My wife laughs. She doesn't even phase her anymore. We're in the car, I'm singing along anything, my voice is terrible, but like I'm gonna sing to whatever it is. And also like I found myself as as I got older, like if I'm still if I'm at a show, I'm singing along with that band, right? But I found yeah. that like the younger generation is a little more reserved with that, even at the same band. So like we were seeing Dashboard Confessional a couple of years ago. Like that band is literally known for the sing along. Yeah. Like they got that MTV unplugged yeah. based off of that everything. And uh like some girl like turned around to me like <laughs> some like 17, 18 year old girl. She's like, sing it, bro. And I was like, Yeah, I will. Why aren't you? Like, you know, and by yeah. the end I I like uh, my wife was with me and I was enough uh, able yeah, to like well that that kid just doesn't know. It. Yeah. But by the end of it, she was singing every word because I would just yeah. I I turned it on her and and kind of shamed her. Dude, <laughs> I know, mean, it, but. to to be fair to to them, um, my my wife and I went to see Hot Mulligan play. Okay. Um, at Music Hall of Williamsburg here, and I I love them. Like they're, I think they're one of the best. Like you know, air quote new bands. Um, and like it's very hard for me to get into a lot of new stuff, but also also because like I it's hard to keep up with stuff you know unless you're like following like diving deep into spotify playlists like checking them every now and like all the time i don't know i don't know how people keep up with music now (laughs) um so much but uh but hot mulligan is like one of my favorite newer bands and so like my wife and i went to see them and i'm i was probably 37 at the time this is just like maybe like beginning of last year whatever their last tour was um and uh she's a year younger than me so we're like 36 and 37 on the balcony of music hall of williamsburg and it's just a sea of like 16 year olds right and they're all crowd surfing they're all stage diving and we're looking down there and like we're we're about to have a kid in june but then we weren't and we were just like these kids could be our kids and like i mean i hope i hope our kid is that cool Right. um to go to shows like that but it was just i don't know it was cool to see like because we just for a lot of the show we just like watched these kids um because we were also like oh it's so cute like look at that one they're they're shy and like they don't want to like come out of their shell and then look at that one they're stage diving for the third time like it was cool yeah. like seeing seeing the different you know kids that are there um but yeah man i don't, I don't know i'm uh even at that like I was saying how uh, um, that Taking Back Sunday show I went to at Riot Fest, like that was that was another show I went to by myself, and I still get like nervous, like oh, I'm gonna look like an idiot standing there by myself. But then once Taking Back Sunday started, dude, I just like went straight up through the crowd, and then nothing else mattered, you know? Right. Absolutely. So the audiobook, 
Yeah. It's coming up soon, right? Oh, it's been quite so, an adventure. It's such, yeah. I, I really try to be more open about it on Facebook because like a lot of cool things have come together with it. I mean, like almost all the bands are letting me use their music for free because I'm donating 50% of the royalties to mental health charities and uh, organizations that help musicians and crew through the pandemic, which I've been doing with the book too. Um, like I'll always be donating half of the royalties to charity. Um, and so I've had to reach out because I'm putting the actual music in the audiobook. Um, did I send it to you? No, not yet. No. Oh, I'll send it to you, man, after this. Oh, awesome. Um, but uh, it was recorded by Tyler Posey who played Teen Wolf on MTV's Teen Wolf. Um, but he's also, um, he, he also um, just released a song. He, he played in a band called Five North, which is on John Feldman's record label. But he just released a song solo with Travis Barker. Um, okay. And a female artist named Femme. Okay, um, I, know, I know Femme. Okay, I hadn't yeah. heard of her till, till this collab, but the way people have talked about her, it seems like a lot of people have heard of her. Travis Barker owns music right now. Yeah, I know, man. And so uh, Tyler just released his first song as a solo artist with Travis Barker featuring on that too, um, like last week. Um, and so he's, you know, doing music stuff mainly now, but he's still acting too. Um, and he and I shared a publicist, Big Picture Media represented the book when the book went out um and they repped his bands and so um dana who owns big picture i've known her forever and she got my book she helped me get my book to tyler and he loved it and so he recorded the audiobook he said he wants to do a tv show if i want to do a tv show and awesome. i just got to write that script but yeah but yeah the audiobook is coming together it's been coming together for almost a year now it's taking me that long to get all the songs. I'm still working on getting the Jimmy Eat World songs, um, which which had a development today. Their their manager their manager told me in January that it was looking like we I would be able to use their Phoenix session recordings. Um, that way, I wouldn't have to pay Universal Music to use their Futures recordings. Um, and then we just kind of lost touch since January, and so today. I finally like he and I are Facebook friends. So I saw it. I, I, I finally just I finally decided to. Well, I didn't. I I actually hid that post on Facebook today. Oh really? Um, but uh, um, but it's not like I was calling him out or anything. I actually I actually muted his name on the video because I didn't want it to seem like I was calling him out. So I loved that. I loved the post in general, right? Like the cool. the idea of the community, right? And yeah, I, I've found that through the pandemic just how strong the online community as a whole in this genre of music is and, and how wide reaching it is. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was really neat how, how you kind of spoke to the community of like, Hey, let's, let's work together on this. And I, and I yeah, feel like people are so open to it. And it's happened too. Like, I mean, I got put in touch with two door Cinema, one of someone who worked with two door cinema club through Facebook, through Facebook friends. Um, I mean, like, you know, Mark Wood, Mark Woodbridge, I've, I've only really met him at shows and then we became Facebook friends and like, he's helped me like get in touch with the Juliana theory guys. Um, yeah. I mean the almost none of this would, would have the audiobook wouldn't have happened without the dangerous summer. Like um, I gave AJ the book a long time ago and AJ, the singer from the dangerous summer messaged hopeless records and said, Hey, can you let Mike use my music for free in his audiobook?" And awesome. Hopeless Records was the first, you know, label to say you can use this music for free, um, and the Wonder Years if the Wonder Years approves, um, as long as no one else is getting paid. If anyone else gets paid, then we got to talk about them getting paid. Right. Totally fair. Um, but yeah, man, AJ just being, you know, him and like me knowing Have Mercy and them being friends, like, you know. AJ reaching out for my book and then like um yeah man so many so many cool things have have happened um like the Smoking Popes gave me a cop gave me a version of their song Megan that they own so I wouldn't have to pay Universal Music to use their original version and 
Dana from Big Picture Media like put me in touch with the Smoking Pope's drummer so that could happen. That's like, awesome. It's it's very very cool and and in fact also like just some random people who I've had to go to like music publishing companies to get this stuff. I've just reached out on Facebook and people have like put me in touch with the right people. So it's That's absolutely awesome. like I said I wasn't and like that wasn't like lip service to so people would help. No, absolutely. It's, this book this this audiobook is absolutely a testament to what this community can do. Side note, just so I don't want to get get it lost. If you're a smoking Pope's fan, um, some of my favorite sessions of the book is is surrounding the Megan song. Yeah, I I, I really uh, I loved that. I I connected to that on a level of like definitely being able to relate to it. So um, I, cool. I I don't yeah, want to yeah. you know go any further into it, but that that's a great section chapter of the book. So thanks, man. That's and that's I mean, so much of this book was written in that weekend um in the hotel and that's definitely part of it um and uh yeah i mean i don't i don't know i i feel bad sometimes about that because i like i write about how you know i've been brainwashed by pop culture uh to like romanticize new york city and like in the movies and the music and the books and stuff that have all taught us to do that and now i'm like perpetuating that by like writing something like that that it's like, um, the, yeah, it's just perpetuating that whole romantic thing. And that's another chapter where like other songs pop up in it. Um, and one of the songs that pops up in that chapter is Hands Down by Dashboard Confessional because we go to karaoke. Um, and and um, it's crazy. Like I, like I, I found like pictures from this night that happened like 12 years ago, you know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was just like visiting New York and Chris Caraba, like gave me a version of hands down that he owns. So I wouldn't have to go to universal music. Awesome. Um, and so, yeah, like he's, he's been cool about it too. And, um, and Lisa Loeb, not that she's in the emo scene or anything, but, no. uh, um, <clears throat> I mean, people love the glasses, but uh but she's letting me use stay in the book man. That's awesome. and that's like one of the like such a huge song you know mm -hmm. that's incredible yeah, very cool so i want to leave it as far as the book goes with everybody should check it out um can you buy the the hard copy online right now yeah 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 um so you can go to rockbottombook.com that's my website and there's links on there to barnes and noble Amazon ebook sites. Um, you can also pre-order the audiobook there because I like I've talked to Universal Music about like Universal Music is gonna let me use the Jimmy World songs for a small price. And it's and if so if like Jimmy World's management doesn't come through with letting me use the Phoenix sessions, then I am gonna end up paying for the music just so this thing can get out already. Um, so no matter what, the book's gonna be out by the end of April, the audiobook. So you can pre-order the audiobook now from my website. Um, and you can get you can find the links to the paperbacks there. I also have paperbacks that all like sign and personalize from from my site if you want to buy them from me. Um, but you don't have to. They're, they're a little pricier that way. So if you want to get it from Amazon, that's cool with me. It helps with the charts, so it doesn't bother me if you, you know, I want if you don't, you know, pay the higher price for me. I don't care um yeah so you can find it rockbottombook.com so i don't put my like personal stamp on on a lot of stuff but but this i wholeheartedly do Thanks, um man. i would say if you guys are looking for a read in the next couple of weeks you have a little bit of downtime grab the the soft cover book um buy it through mike's website rockbottombook.com give it a read and and just take like i said I, I was able to read it in three days and that's like with having a a 16 month old kid running around like trying to grab the book out of my hand the whole time it that it's that that you know it grabs you and it holds you and and you want to read it and it's not like to the point where you it's a it's it's not a chore to read right so get that and then when the audio book comes out like i'm so excited for the audio book with the addition of the music so pre-order that audio book and and experience it that way so when you read when, when i read it right i have my internal um voice right yeah so <laughs> yeah. so so I, I i'm 
I'm reading this and, and, and I'm taking, you know, I, I'm, I'm developing the pictures in my head and, and I'm reading it in the way that I would read it. And I do this usually whenever there's an audio book, I, I read the book first and then I get the audio book and I find so much more and I get so much more from the audio book because I'm getting it from somebody else's perspective a little Dude, bit. The audio book is so different because Tyler Posey is such a right. great like actor and performer. And I, I sat down with him. I'm going to be releasing some videos in the next month. Um, cause I flew out to LA and just like talked to him about the book for like an hour. And so I'm splitting that up. And I told him, man, it's like, I love what he did because now when I listen to this book, it doesn't feel like me anymore. It just feels like a, a book about somebody who went through this stuff. Um, he does such, and that's another thing too. It's like, he's been very open about the mental health stuff that he's dealt with. Mm -hmm. And so like, he really related to the book like he's an emo kid too he dj'd la emo night you know and he plays in a pop punk band and just released a song with travis barker like this kid is from this scene but he also like struggles with the mental health stuff too so he like really became this character and it's so different and you i mean other people have said that you know parts of it feel like you can they can see it as like a tv show or something when you hear him do it dude it's it's very much like a tv show i can't wait i get to experience it a whole nother yeah. way and, and again i don't know if you notice this because some people don't notice it and i i all the all the 20 copies of books i have right now are being used as a uh stand for my camera oh <laughs> so that's I awesome grab, i can't grab one <laughs> But uh, in the front of the in the front of the book, there's the QR codes. Did you see those? Let's see here. Well, I don't want to put them on the screen so nobody can. Or do you want them up? Oh, I mean, no. It's just I'm just saying, like an example. People don't oh, yeah, have to yeah, scan yeah. them. But yeah. yeah. So those QR codes, like you can scan them, and you get a, a Spotify cool. playlist or an Apple Music playlist, so you can listen to the songs as you go through the book. Um, because you know, there's only 16 chapters but there's like 30 or 40 songs mentioned in the book so the playlist has the Dion and the Belmont songs the cure um you know uh Taylor Swift because there's no way I'm putting a Taylor Swift song in my book right um which I also watched your I also watched your video about Taylor Swift um saying that she deserves to own her art <laughs> I think I said she doesn't oh no I know but her oh, saying yeah, yeah, that yeah. she does oh yeah 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 um, yeah 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 not um and that, that, that's, that's early YouTube me. That was, uh, yeah. that's when I say like trying to like have my pulse on, on the finger of it. And yeah. I, I was like, I'm, how do I get a bunch of people to watch this video? Like go oh, against, for sure. Yeah. Go You're not stuff, wrong. Right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like I, um, I wish I would, I wish I could get a Taylor Swift song in this book, man. Um, uh, but, uh, the lyrics are in there. Go, go through, um, um ryan reynolds no what's his name uh scooter braun she hates him right oh i know but she's make, not make, she's make not allowing beef. she's not allowing anybody to use her music like whatever part she owns of it she's not allowing allowing licensing of her music until she re-records it oh she still has that control yeah she still has a, a i mean i'm sure she has publishing rights okay if not masters yeah she probably doesn't have masters but she has publishing rights okay um and so, yeah, she, that's why she's re-recording everything. But Ryan Reynolds has a, like, advertising agency. And okay. he, did, he did this, like, Match.com commercial recently where it was Satan getting matched with the year 2020. <laughs> I saw that, yes. Um, and I didn't know the, he did it, but. The commercial had, uh, I mean, his company did it, but the commercial had Taylor Swift's Love Story playing on it. And mm -hmm. she re-recorded Love Story and let him use it. Oh, okay. Because they're like celebrity friends, you know? Right, right, right. Uh, so I just need to get to the celebrity level where she'll re-record um, the moment I knew for me so I can use it in my book. There you go. <laughs> Nothing is out um, of the realm of possibility. Maybe Chris Carabo can hook that up. Yeah. find some. She's from Bethlehem, I think, Pennsylvania originally. So. Oh, really? Yeah, maybe you could find, uh, you know, some, <laughs> try and think who's from there. We'll see. <laughs> maybe there's remember. someone listening who, who has yeah, exactly. and they can they can hook it up. But yeah, so those QR codes, like you can scan them and, um, you know, listen to listen to all the songs. It, the The playlists are in order of the songs being mentioned in the book. So once something pops up, you can just bam play it if you want. 
Awesome. That's great. I remember, I forgot about it since I've read the book, but I remember opening the book the first time and seeing that and being like, oh, that's such a cool idea. And just that we yeah. can, that we can do that now. Right. Like, yeah, a lot of people phones, missed yeah, it. You know. And in some of the earlier prints, they were smaller. And so I made them bigger. So I don't yeah. know, but yeah, I, I totally dig it. So I want to say thanks so much for having on, especially yeah, you. last minute. Um, podcast was going to come out next week. It'll be out Friday. Um, cool. Start pumping it out. And I'm, I'm just very grateful. And I, I've been excited for this one. And uh, I, I wanted to reach out to you recently because I, like I said, I just finished reading it for the second time. And I was That's originally, awesome, uh, before, before we had kind of connected on the, the podcast thing, I was going to do a video on it. That was what we originally discussed. Oh, I was yeah, going to kind of yeah. just break it down in a video. Um, so I, I was, I'm very analytical with my videos. So I really want to do a ton of research <laughs> and, and be in there. And I want to make sure it was fresh. Oh, in my head. Good. So I reread it, but I think this lens, you know, having your perspective involved in on the podcast lends so much more justice to it than I ever, ever could have done by, by doing a video. Now I always, I always appreciate getting to talk about it and, and not even for the promotional side of it, but because like, I, it's like, continued therapy for me to like talk this stuff out out loud you know and I mean we don't get opportunities for that as much as we used to so right. um, I appreciate you doing it last minute too man no uh, I, I very <laughs> much appreciate it. we're not gonna talk about the, uh, the other situation but I but I do appreciate it so thank you so much everybody yeah. go check out rock bottom at the renaissance and I know that uh, if you're an emo kid this one's going to hit home for you, be it from the playlist to the stories. It's relatable for everybody. It's an easy read. It's a great read. Um, I encourage everybody to go check it out. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And if you guys are still listening, then I want you to hit subscribe, like this video, share it, and uh, I'll see you next week.